Bye. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop on Site Management Tools and Practice. This session will be recorded. If you experience the technical difficulty, please press star zero for assistance. Now I'd like to direct the audience to force their screen to full view by pressing the small icon located in the bottom right corner of your screen. You're looking for a blue box with arrows pointing out from the corner. Please click that icon now to bring the presentation to full view. At this time, I'll turn the podium over to Ms. Liz Buttry. Please go ahead. Thank you, Melanie. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Liz Buttry, the Training Coordinator for the Clinical Coordinating Center. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Frankie Krupp and Gloria Mealy for presenting today and sharing their expertise with us. Today's session is part one of a three-part workshop series on site management. Please be sure to register for the next two sessions that will take place on April 23rd and May 7th. Email, I'm sorry, email invitations will be distributed. Um, to enable an auto-registration process just by clicking reply to the email. Uh, so keep on the lookout for that, and I will turn things over to you. Gloria? Thanks, Liz. This is Gloria Neely. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Frankie and I are really happy to be here and to be providing you training on project management. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is get a sense of who's on the call uh, by doing a little poll. So if you could please indicate your project management experience level, and you can click right on your screen. And those results will continue to tally as we near our total number of participants. And so as you see, we have uh, people on the call with a greater level of experience, six or more years, as well as uh, almost half of the participants with zero to two years of experience, and a few people right in the middle. So one of the reasons that we are having this seminar is not only to give the more new participants some great tools to be using uh, that are based on Frankie and I's years of experience in the CTN, but also to invite these uh, other project managers who have been working in the CTN for many years and even in project management perhaps outside the CTN uh, to share your experiences and the tools that have helped you make your project successful. Uh, so this is great. We've got a nice range of experience on the call, and we will have opportunities um, for interaction and questions and, and feedback as we go along. So let's look at our next polling question. And we want to get a sense of when your next study is expected to begin see when people are getting ready to run another trial. So we have a very evenly distributed group. I did not make that up, really. How? Um, this is, <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is really amazing. Uh, so there are like a quarter of you are getting ready to go, and a, a quarter or three to six months out, and you see the results there. So uh, again, some of you are looking for uh, tools to use in the very near future, and some of you, you know, looking to use some of these tools on the horizon. And, uh, and that's great. So if you have questions relevant to preparations that you're doing now, we hope that uh, this forum will provide an opportunity for you to get some of those questions answered, not only from us, but as I said, from a lot of the other uh, very experienced people on the call. So that's great. Thank you. Let's go back to the presentation. 
So we will be opening up the phone lines um, at the end of each section, right, Gloria? Yes, we will. Right. And and sometimes in the middle. <laughs> but we'll we'll tell you when. Absolutely. All right, so I think we are just about ready to go. As I said, our, our uh, intention here is to really provide an interactive opportunity to give you some uh, background on project management, some background on the way things work in the CTN, and then also some specific tools. We have a toolkit that we'll be sharing with you, and I think you've already received some of those materials tools that you can use to help you plan for your projects. And then also we will give you the opportunity to share some of your tools, not only on the call, but by uh, actually putting them in the toolkit. And I think Liz will talk about that a little bit more later. Right, Lori. Okay. So with all that said, I'm going to turn this over to Frankie. All righty. Well, those of you that have heard uh, any of my trainings, you know that I love to do metaphors. So I wanted to think about a metaphor that would work really well for how the the project team functions. And I come from a railroad family. So for me, that, that fit is a really good metaphor. My mother's side of the family worked in a number of capacities for the old Louisville and Nashville Railroad, which later became part of the CSX, if you're railroad type people. Um, I had a grandfather who was in charge of all of the signals and communications for the railroad in Kentucky. Uh, I had an uncle who was a, a fireman on the railroad. My great-grandfather uh, was a conductor. My cousin Mike currently is an engineer. And my mother actually was raised on a train until she was old enough to go to school. So when I think about um, many things, you know, the, a, a train image comes to mind. And so I'd like to specifically talk about the engineer and the conductor, because I think these are really nice metaphors for relationships in the, in the study team. Most folks who are outside of the railroad industry think that the engineer is the only person who drives the train, but this is really not true. While the engineer had, does have ultimate responsibility, he or she works really closely with the conductor, and the engineer-conductor roles are a great metaphor for the relationship between the um, principal investigator and the project manager. So let's go ahead and take a little closer look at this. Let's we'll start by talking about the engineer. The engineer is responsible for a number of things, like preparing the equipment for service, checking the paperwork and the condition of the locomotives, he or she must control acceleration and braking and handling of the train that's underway. They have to know the physical characteristics of the railroad, including all the stations, the incline, the decline, the right-of-way, the speed limits, all of that stuff. And along with the conductor, the engineer monitors the time so that they do not fall behind schedule or leave the, the station too early. Sometimes the train speed has to be reduced when following other trains or um, just in order to uh, avoid arriving too early. And the engineer is really the one in charge of making the final decisions on this. Now, the conductor, if you've seen old railroad, you know, railroads in like old cowboy movies and stuff, the conductor is usually seen as just the person who's going around taking up the tickets. But they have a great deal more responsibilities for that. Jointly, they coordinate with both the engineer and the dispatcher. Um, they are in charge of the train's movement authority, verifying that the authority of the train is not exceeded, communicating and coordinating with the other parties concerning the operation of the train. They have to be alert to um, outside signals, such as the positions of switches and uh, other um, weather conditions or other kinds of conditions that might affect the safe movement of the train. They have to mechanically or, or inspect the, the, mechanic, the mechanics of the rolling stock. They assist the engineer in testing the brakes. They signal the engineer when to start moving, when to stop. They keep a record or a log of the journey. They do indeed collect fares and check the tickets, and, but they also attend to the needs of all the passengers. 
Um, and generally just directing and coordinating and sometimes manually performing all of the functions that the train needs to perform. So in general, the engineer really is ultimately responsible for the train's performance, but it's the conductor that brings together the crew and oversees the implementation of all the necessary procedures for operating the train. So now that you know the two main players, I want to tell you a story. And oh yeah, what I forgot to tell you was that my mom, who grew up on a train, um, actually when she was an adult became a children's librarian. So I'd like you all to think about that you're in a circle and you've got your little cup of milk and your little you know, box of animal crackers and you're going to sit down and you're going to listen to Miss Frankie tell a story. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a railroad called NIDA Rail Lines. NIDA Rail Lines had lots and lots of trains, and they went lots and lots of places. It was important to NIDA Rail Lines that all the trains carried their passengers efficiently, safety, and economically to their destination. NIDA Rail Lines suggested selected only the best trains for its fleet and made sure that all the railroad workers were the best in the nation. That would be you, so you can pat yourself on the back. One day, Miss Nora, the president of NIDA Rail Lines, decided that it would be good to have some of the trains carry people on a long journey all the way across the country. The trains would pick up passengers from all over, but the final destination would be the same, the beautiful mountains of Kentucky. She chose five trains to go there, gave them the map, and told the engineers in each region to make all the arrangements. The engineer called the conductor and showed her the map. Next, the conductor called together the regional crew leaders, and together they talked about what it would be needed to make the journey. How much will it cost, asked the train's bookkeeper. How many people do we need to take care of the passengers, asked the head porter. Do we need any special equipment, asked the train's maintenance foreman. Don't forget, we will need special licenses to pass through all the states, said the regional regulations chief. After their meeting, the conductor got to work, making sure all the questions were answered and the plans were clear. Good work, said the engineer. Let's try to make our first trip as quickly as possible. Finally, the big day came. The conductor had made sure that all the licenses were in place, that the bookkeeper knew how much it would cost, that the equipment and supplies were purchased, and that all the crew knew what they needed to do to make sure the train was working well, the passengers were safe and comfortable, and they reached their destination in time. The train inspectors from NIDA Railways came and said everything looked good. Miss Nora told the engineer to begin. The ticket office began selling tickets, and pretty soon, the train was ready for its first trip. All aboard, the conductor said. The engineer gave the signal, and off they went. The conductor kept a close eye on everything as they went past towns, through forests, and over bridges. Sometimes a passenger would say they didn't feel well, and the conductor made sure the crew and the passenger cars took care of it. Sometimes when they stopped at a town to let the passengers rest, some of the passengers never came back. The conductor made sure the crew tried to find them, but sometimes they just could not be found. Sometimes it seemed like the train was going too slow, and sometimes the train seemed to be going so fast that the other workers on the train had problems doing their jobs. Through it all, the conductor kept the engineer informed, so the engineer could give the signal to stop, speed up, slow down, or even change tracks if needed. Finally, they saw the beautiful mountains of Kentucky. They had worked together to bring the passengers here safely, and their long journey was over. Miss Nora smiled. The porters, the brakemen, and all the other crew members were congratulated on their good work. The engineer was proud and said, great job. And the conductor, tired but happy, just smiled and yawned, thinking about the next trip the train would make. So, 
What did we learn from the story, boys and girls? Well, although each railroad position is different and comes with varying levels of responsibility, each crew member has a unique role to play. And the conductor is there to make sure that each role and its procedures integrate smoothly with all the others. In the same way, a study involves a large number of study roles and the procedures associated with each one. It's necessary to ensure that everything is coordinated appropriately. And while the PI is always the leader of the team, the PI generally is, in, is busy with other duties involved with mo moving the project forward, just as the engineer is focused on actually driving the locomotive so that the train can go down the tracks. So the project manager, as with the conductor, is needed to take care of all those details that keep that get and keep things running as they should be. And in research, as in railroading, lack of coordination comes with a really high risk for serious problems. So I want to talk a little bit about three levels of project management. Because when we talk about someone being a project manager, Depending on the node and depending on the project, that may mean a number of things. The first level I want to talk about are project managers who are participating at just a single site, just as you might have a conductor who's responsible for only one train. Now, being a project manager for a single site involves a close working relationship with the study staff there, so it's critical to consult with the site PI to determine whether your particular role is one of a direct supervisor or whether you are more of a consultant than a mentor. If a direct supervisor, then the project manager should be on site on a regular basis to observe and direct the day-to-day -day operations of the study in that site. But if you're primarily at the RRTC, you most likely will be functioning as a mentor rather than a supervisor and you'll be directing the general management of the operations rather than the actual day-to-day -day operations. In either case, though, you're going to be taking a hands-on approach to site preparation, and you're going to be working closely with the site study team, including the site PI, throughout the entire study period. Another way in which you might serve as a project manager is in managing multiple sites, but within one node. This would be like someone who was a conductor for a number of trains, but they all those trains were within one region. When managing multiple participating sites within your own node, you may again serve either a supervisory or a mentoring function, and you'll play a major role in the management of the study in each site. But with multiple sites, there's an added layer of complexity that may benefit from having things like group study supervision or management meetings in order to ensure consistency among your sites. In addition, you'll need to manage your node resources so that they're effectively distributed among all your sites. For example, you may find that it's more expedient to handle supplies using a centralized approach at your node and just distribute to each of your sites on an as-needed basis. You'll also need to serve as the point person between the RRTC and each site to ensure that all other essential study functions, such as training and regulatory and trial performance monitoring, are coordinated among all your sites, again, in order to maximize your node resources. The third level is as a lead project manager. Um, just as you might have a lead conductor who supervises all of the trains going to a particular destination. As the lead project manager, you're most likely several layers away from the individual study sites. So at this level, you may have some direct manage mentoring of site staff, but it's more likely that what you'll be doing is collaborating with each participating site's project manager to ensure that, that adequate study oversight occurs. Also, as the lead project manager, you'll be responsible for providing guidance to all the sites throughout the study. You'll need to ensure that all the standard materials, like the manuals and the forms and regulatory submission packets and training elements and things like that, have been provided to each participating site. And you'll need to follow up to ensure that the study timeline is followed. While you might engage in site-specific problem solving from time to time, it's more likely that you'll be working with your lead team to develop strategies to overcome difficulties that are faced study-wide.
Depending on the experience of a project manager, he or she may work more or less independently. A very experienced project manager may be given almost complete autonomy in running the study, while a more junior project manager can expect to receive ongoing assistance in deciding what needs to be done and in carrying out the required activities. Whatever level you're at, at the beginning of the implementation of the study, the site PI and the project manager, or the lead PI and the lead project manager, should come to some understanding of how much autonomy the project manager will have. And knowing that this might change as the study progresses and as the project manager becomes more experienced. Now that we've introduced you to the role of project manager, the rest of our time together will be spent looking at the wide variety of responsibilities that may come with that. Along the way, we'll ask for your experiences and share some tools that may help you perform some of the specific study management tasks. So if you're ready, Gloria, this train's about to leave the station. All aboard. I was so looking forward to that. So thank you, Frankie, for that wonderful metaphor and the great story. And now, uh, although it's a bit of a tough act to follow, uh, I'm going to move on to talk about some of these specific project management responsibilities that you will find in your job as a project manager. So, and Frankie has already alluded to a number of these, but now more specifically, a project manager serves as a liaison. And that's one of their primary roles. Uh, and this is to help coordinate among the various groups that interact with each site. Now, as you can see here, the project manager at the node level serves as a go-between for the site and the participating node for the site and the lead node, and for the site and the staff at the Clinical Coordinating Center and the Data and Statistics Center. If multiple local sites are involved, the project manager may also serve as a go-between for all the nodes participating sites, as well as representing the node in discussions with the lead node, the CCC, and the DSC. As a lead project manager, you're likely to serve as the lead node representative coordinating issues with the nodes, the sites, and the NIDA contractors for the study. So a lot of liaison responsibilities. Now another essential component of being a project manager is communication. Although there may be direct communication between the various groups involved in the study, it's really critical that the project manager is involved in at least being aware of all the communications that pertain to the study, and in many cases will serve as the communication switchboard, sending and receiving information, information between the group you represent and other groups involved in the study. This also may include outside entities like vendors, state and local licensing agencies, and so on. So just like on the train, uh, communication is really essential. Another really important component of project management is providing staff supervision and mentoring. Uh, as I noted, as noted earlier by Frankie, the project manager may directly supervise study staff, may directly supervise the supervisor of the study staff, or simply serve to provide general study oversight. At minimum, so the project manager should take every opportunity to guide and mentor study staff to help them further develop their research skills. And we're going to spend more time in our next workshop on supervisory skills and leadership skills and team building uh, that also will are really essential in project management. So be sure to register for the next course. Now, also, the project manager deals with a lot of logistics uh, and basically heading up um, the management of study logistics, which could be issues as large as arranging for contracts for study supplies to issues as small as figuring out how to handle staffing on an upcoming holiday. But in any case, the project manager is charged with participating in a problem-solving process and then coordinating among all the relevant groups 
and providing adequate documentation of whatever kinds of logistics are being managed. Part of the problem solving and coordination also entails good delegation skills, and that too will be uh, addressed in our next workshop. Another critical responsibility of being a project manager is monitoring the progress of the study. This isn't the same as being a study monitor, although at some nodes the project manager may be asked to also take on the, the duty of a trial progress monitor, performing regular checks of the study sources and database. In general, though, the project manager will monitor the progress of the study through various summary reports, both internal reports and study-wide reports, and through ongoing project management meetings, both at the national and the local levels. And Gloria, can I just jump in? Yeah. I just wanted to say that, that that too is something that we will take a look at in, I think, session three. Yes. Uh, now, this would probably be a good time to open up the lines for any questions or comments up until this point. Melanie, can we open up the lines, please? All lines are open at this point. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? This is Davina. I just wanted to tell Frankie how much I enjoyed her metaphor. <laughs> Thank you. It is a good one. All right. Well, I guess everybody's clear on their responsibilities and just want to hear more about how to develop a project plan. Okay. Um, well, with that, we'll go ahead and close the lines back down for a minute. Thanks, Melanie. You're welcome. Okay, so for the rest of our time together, um, Gloria and I are going to be looking very specifically at a number of areas that it's really critical to consider as you put together a project plan for an upcoming protocol. Um, we're going to begin by doing a more thorough examination of what it means to be a project manager by starting early in the study preparation process and examining the various tasks involved in putting together this project plan. And just to let you know that we'll be post, well, we actually have posted um, all of these tools in a folder on LiveLink. And we encourage you to explore those and to use them as as you know, you find helpful to you. Also, Liz has set it up, though, so that if you have something to share, um, uh, some kind of a tool that you've used in a previous study that you all developed, or um, uh, something that, some guidance that you think would be really helpful for other project managers, um, Liz has, has made it so that there's a capability there to go ahead and post that document so that you can share it with everybody in the CTN. Um, Liz, would you like to tell folks how to find that folder before we go on? Sure. Once you enter into LiveLink, you're going to um, follow the folders for the CTN. You'll go to the CCC. You'll see a training folder. Once you get into the training folder, you're, you'll see a folder for Project Management Toolkit. And we have all kinds of, um, I guess, topic-specific folders available for people to go ahead and put information in there. If you're unable to load the document in there, you can email it to me, either at ebotry at ms.com, or you can send it to the CTN, um, to CCC training uh, at ms.com. And I will um, send a follow-up email message out to everybody with this information included. Thanks, Frankie. That's great. Thanks, Liz. And just, you know, just so you know, we're going to be covering a lot of tools over these three sessions, but there's tons and tons of other tools out there that if if all we did was review tools, I mean that would take up the whole the whole three session process. So there will be uh, things that we'll be posting in there um, during this series that we won't talk about online. So if you see something in there and you wonder, gosh, uh, they didn't talk about this, I wonder how to use it. You can feel free to go ahead and um, pass that information along either to me or to Liz, and we'll try to, to get you an answer, or Gloria, and we'll try to get you an answer as to how that particular form was used. 
But uh, again, just just to keep in mind that you're not alone in this, and it's really important that we share the knowledge. All right. Um, one of the first things that will assist in project plan development is to perform a, a really thorough review of the protocol. This will allow the project manager to identify some potential sources of difficulty so that they can be tackled early on. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to just have some discussion. Without pointing fingers at somebody else's study team, I wondered if anybody had any stories about being caught by surprise either late in their pre-initiation process or after the protocol has already started. And Liz, could we open up the lines just briefly to see if anybody has any good stories on that? Absolutely. Melanie? All lines here open. Thanks. So any good stories out there about being caught by surprise? Hi, Frankie. This is Scott from uh, northern New England. Yeah. Um, so I, I, just to, for some context, maybe uh, I'm involved in the C1030 uh, prescription opiate study, and uh, our node is the lead node for the study. So that, that's kind of like the, the framework for our position. And um, one thing that we noticed early on is uh, as sites were kind of preparing to start the study and they were kind of considering their staffing levels, um, a number of sites wanted to find out if it was okay for uh, nurses to administer the study medication. And we had to clarify uh, for them, because uh, the protocol said that uh, the medication would be administered by a, a licensed medical clinician. So we had to clarify that it was uh, not a nursing level staff, it was an MD uh, that was providing the medication. So that was kind of like, you know, a small surprise that can happen along the way. And you have to review the protocol carefully and then, um, you know, adjust your staffing levels accordingly. Right. That's a great example, Scott. Thanks. Any other examples? Hey, Gloria, didn't you, weren't you telling me something about protocol um, 15 the other day? Um, your inclusion exclusion criteria? Uh, right. Yes, definitely. Um, we were... Uh, the lead on Protocol 15, the Women in Trauma Study. And when we developed the protocol, uh, we had put that the primary inclusion criterion was going to be drug or alcohol uh, abuse within the past, it was either six months or a year. And as sites were coming on, um, it became clear that because people enter into treatment at different levels of sobriety, we were going to have trouble recruiting uh, as a result of that. So we did have to modify uh, the inclusion criteria to also include alcohol abuse or, or dependence. Um, and so that was something just as, as a matter of um, you know, starting the study and, and working with the sites and getting that kind of feedback that we did have to make that modification. That's a great example. Any others? Well, if not, let's go ahead and close the, the phone lines back. The lines are closed. Thanks. And I'll, I'll tell a story on myself as well. Um, some of you are involved in CTN 31A, which is an ancillary to the Stage 12 study. And in 31A, it, there's some heavy-duty blood processing that goes on. And we're using two reagents in order to process the blood that's drawn and shipped to the study central lab. Now, I am definitely not a, chem a chemist. Uh, in fact, um, if you know anything about me, you might know that I used to be in pre-med, and chemistry is exactly why I am not in pre-med, <laughs> why I did not finish up in pre-med. Uh, so after the study had started, I mean, we, you know, we had talked to the lab, and we'd gotten these reagents shipped out to the sites, and um, after uh, the study had already started, a question came up, something about uh, the, the reagent. And so I called the lab and I asked this question. And during the course of this conversation, they told me that the reagent that we were talking about was supposed to have been refrigerated. Well, fortunately for me, I, I, there was a lot of scrambling and I was able to get uh, with the supplier and confirm that it 
it actually did have a, a fair shelf life at room temperature, so our samples were probably okay. But, uh, you know, so our samples were fine, but not, not knowing that piece up front had caused me to, uh, first of all, omit telling the sites that they needed a refrigerator, which affected the study budget and space issues. Um, it also affected the SOP, and it also caused the sites that had already launched to really scramble in order to find a refrigerator, find a place for it, and that sort of thing. And um, all of this could have been avoided if, if I had been um, aware of those issues with the reagents. And, I, and certainly if somebody out there who had reviewed the protocol who knew more about chemistry than I did, who had, you know, emailed me and said, oh, hey, Frankie, are you remembering that you have to refrigerate our PMI? Uh, I would very much, as a lead uh, protocol manager, I, I would very much have appreciated that. I can, I can tell you that for sure. So um, at, at the site level, you know, not, it's, it's not just the protocol development team that needs to be reviewing and, and providing feedback on, on the protocol, but actually sites that are planning on being in the study, um, to the extent that it's permitted, it would be great if the PI or the protocol manager was allowed to participate in some of the protocol development phone calls, um, particularly as the protocol is nearing completion, so that they can be aware of some of the issues that might come up. Once the protocol is sent out to the sites then, both the, the PI and the protocol manager should carefully review the protocol. And you might pass this out to other members of your, your study team at your site as well to look at, at the particular sections that are most pertinent to them. So some things that you're going to look at are um, unnecessarily strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, which will make recruitment difficult. I think it's really critical to always assume that recruitment will be difficult and to, to begin up front to look for ways that we're gonna, are going to make it successful. But one of the things you want to look at um, in the protocol are things that might cause a, a barrier to that. You also want to look at things like overly rigid writing in the protocol that might lead to some unnecessary protocol violations. For example, we're doing a pharmaceutical trial here in Cincinnati. And one of the things about that trial is that it was extremely rigid in the days on which urine samples had to be collected. And there really wasn't any kind of margin for leeway on either side. So we've run into situations where um, we've had to schedule client visits on you know, days like Christmas and New Year's and the 4th of July and um, you know, make sure that we had staff available for that. And, uh, it, it's just it's caused a hardship not just on the study staff but also on on the clients and also on the study because half the time the participants don't show up when it's on a holiday. Other kinds of things that we want to look out for are places where the protocol might contradict itself or is otherwise inconsistent. Um, those of you that have served as lead protocol managers, you know that uh, as you go through a protocol and um, a change is made. You try to get all of the spots that that affects within the protocol, but you're not always successful at that. Sometimes, you know, you, you think you've caught everything, but way down on the, you know, next to the last page, there's a number there that you meant to change that you forgot to change. Uh, things like unrealistic time schedules, staffing requirements that are unnecessarily restrictive, so things like that. And I want to share a tool with you now. And this is one that I believe was sent out to you. Again, this is, you know, it's, it's not copyrighted or anything like that. You know, feel free to take it and use it and amend it as you, as you see fit. Um, let me back it up to the first page. This is just a, a tool that I put together called the Protocols Issue Collection Sheet. And this would be an, an opportunity to, uh, log in all of the feedback that you receive from your own study team about what happened during the, the protocol review, some of the things that you found that were really pertinent to the study. And it's not just 
um, things that are problematic, but it's also things that you need to know for purposes of things like budgeting and um, space requirements at your site and that sort of stuff. So if you look on, on the first page here, you'll see, you know, recruitment and study staffing goes in there. Um, down at the bottom, looking at things like what do we need to run this study? What what do we have to have in our facility? How many rooms do we need at minimum for the RA? Is a lab area required? If yes, what all kinds of specifications do we need for that? If your study has counselors in it, how many rooms do you need to have for the counselors? Any kind of special IT needs, um, you have to make sure, you know, in some sites that there's uh, internet uh, capability or that, um, you know, maybe the, the study uses some kind of a high-powered software that requires later versions of, of some basic programs. And you'll have to look into that to make sure that your computers that you have on site can handle that and know, you know, gee, do we need to upgrade? Do we need to get fresh computers? What do we need to do? Looking at things like pharmacy needs, and that would include things like, do we need a pharmacy? Are we going to go to the pharmacy down the street? Is there a closet that we can use for our pharmacy? And that involves also things like, for the 30 study, we had to determine um, some DEA uh, procedures that uh, required a lot of back and forth and back and forth with uh, the DEA, uh, they don't, they don't call them agents. Um, I don't, anyway, it was a DEA person who was in charge of uh, taking care of that facility to make sure that they were in tune, reg, you know, regulations-wise. And she didn't know the answer. And so there were several months back and forth, back and forth, where there was no clear-cut answer on, on this one particular DEA regulation. And so we ended up with writing a, a local... DEA SOP sort of thing um, and putting that into our regulatory binder that allowed us to handle um, the buprenorphine the way we handled it for the study. Other kinds of things that you might collect on this sheet are what different kinds of study procedures are we going to have to be involved with. Uh, right now, for example, I am, um, we're in the protocol development phase of CTN 46, which is a smoking cessation trial, and I'm serving as the national project manager for that. And one of the things that's come up is the question of if you use a CLIA-approved but non-CLIA-waived test in a site, what does that mean that the site has to, has to have? And so that's one of the things we were talking about this morning, and my job now is going to go to... Uh, be one of, you know, finding out what does that mean and how can I provide guidance for the site on, on that issue. Other kinds of procedures that we might want to take note of are things like, you know, what are the medication procedures involved in the study? Is that going to, how does that impact our site? Uh, what's the timing and the length of the study visits? This tells you, for example, when you get to figuring out how much staff you need, um, it's important to know how much time each visit will take. Um, the RA assessments versus the counselor assessments versus the medical assessments, any kind of major purchases that have to be made for the study. Again, for 31, we had to purchase centrifuges and uh, minus 70 freezers. And we, you know, kind of went back and forth at the lead level trying to determine whether it was more appropriate to ask the sites to do that and give them that money in their in their site budget or whether it was more appropriate for the lead site to buy them and just send them to this to the sites and ultimately that's what we decided to do. Um, training, what kind of training is going to be involved? That helps you know what kind of lead time you need in terms of hiring. Also tells you how much you're going to perhaps spend. Uh, as you're developing your local budget uh, for folks to attend the national training, um, are we going to need to retain a trainer on site? I know, you know, back in the old days of the CTN, every node had had trainers for all kinds of things, and that's just not so anymore. Uh, although we're kind of moving back in that direction, uh, I think there's still some some nodes that that don't have access to their own trainers for certain things. 
So we'll need to know, you know, does the local node need to retain a trainer? Or if we get new staff at the local level, will somebody at the lead node manage that? You want to look at regulatory things, how many consents, if assets are needed, if you're using adolescents, what kind of recruitment and retention tools do we need to develop for our particular site? Is, is the IRB that's going to be used our local IRB, or is there going to be a centralized IRB, as there is now with CTN32? And what are some of the common protocol deviations that we expect to come up based on what we've read in this protocol? What are some of the things to watch out for? Safety the same way. What kind of frequent AEs do we expect to find? And um, one of the things that's kind of new, but are there any exceptions to the adverse events or the serious adverse events that get reported? And we need to be aware of those things up front so that we can think about those as we develop our SOPs and as we train our monitors and, and um, those kinds of issues. And then, of course, there's all other kinds of issues that might come up. So again, this is just about you know, uh, a, a nice way of summarizing all of this stuff. Um, and then you can decide what to do with that information later. So let me go back to the slideshow. And before you jump in and begin to um, prepare things for the study, based on your review of the protocol. It's really important to see what the lead team already plans on providing for you. So for example, like in 31A, if somebody read the protocol and they said, oh gosh, we're going to need a minus 70 freezer, before they went out and shelled out the you know, $2,000 or whatever it was per freezer, you know, we would have wanted them to call us and say, are you buying this or are, are we supposed to buy this? Same kind of thing with uh, study materials, like you know, some of the logs and progress notes and things like that. It's really critical that you identify up front some of the elements that uh, may be needed, but it's, it's also important that you find out from the lead team how much of this will be provided and how much of this you, as at the site level, need to develop for your study team so that you're not um, uh, spending time doing work that is for nothing. In some cases, the lead team already has a really good idea of what materials they'll be using and what format will work best. But in other cases, the lead team knows what kinds of materials they need, but they've not yet worked out the details. And in this situation, you as a project manager can actually become a collaborator with the lead team and assist them by providing some samples of materials that you've found helpful in the past. And then in other situations, the lead team may not have thought about materials for the issue that you've just brought up. And a really good project manager, again, can assist them by providing feedback on how these issues may have been handled in previous studies and offering some suggestions or sample materials for the lead team to, to use as a jumping off point as they develop the materials for this study. I think it's really important uh, to keep in mind that in the CTN, yes, we're all different nodes, and um, uh, we all have our own our own you know te study teams and that kind of stuff. But really, you know, part of being a network is um, being a team all together. And keep in mind that in the CTN, we're all team members, and we're all working for the common good. So when when we as a site help out the lead team, we ultimately are helping ourselves. And there's simply no reason for anybody in the CTN to have to reinvent the wheel if there's already good tools available to them. So as you, you know, you've, you've gotten the protocol and your team has looked at it and you've uh, developed um, a list of some issues. And now what you want to do is let the lead team know uh, what your role is in the study so that you can, right off the bat, begin coordinating with them and serving as a li liaison between the lead team and your, and your site. Uh, you might do it, this is a really formal way to do it up here on the screen, so you might write this, this little formal email, 
if you already know the team members, you might just pick up the phone and go, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in your study, um, and I'm going to serve as the protocol manager, and I've just got some questions for you. And so, you, you know, you have your little protocol summary sheet there, and maybe you, you know, you set a time to ask the questions of, of the lead team about this. But it's really important that as early as possible you um, make initial contact with the lead team and let them know the role that you serve. Hey, Frankie. Yeah. Hey, Chris, if we can jump back one. So is this just an establishment of goodwill, just to um, open the lines of communication? And would you be copying the other sites on this communication? Um, I guess you could. I hadn't really thought about that. It, it actually is more than goodwill. Uh, it, it's, it's really getting the, the coordinating process started. Um, certainly some of that is goodwill because you, you don't want them to be wondering about who at the site level is, is going to be responsible for that site. But the more quickly you establish this communication, these lines of communication, and begin talking about these issues very preliminarily, uh, the more benefit you can be to the study as a whole. So, for example, if I, as a, um, a, a project manager or protocol manager for a, a, an individual site, I get the, um, the non-approved version of the protocol. So, you know, it's left night as hands, but it hasn't gone to the IRB yet. And I see something that where it contradicts itself. I can either sit on that information and go, oh, well, I guess they'll figure it out, or I can pick up the phone and go, you know, like maybe I'm, you know, if it happened in 30, I might have picked up the phone and said, hey, Scott, it's Frankie. I've uh, been looking for your protocol, and I'm going to be the project manager for 30, and uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention a discrepancy that you guys might want to look at um, before you, uh, you know, before you go to the IRB with this. And so, you know, saving them some steps as well. So it's really more, more than goodwill. It's, it's starting right away to uh, inspect the equipment, so to speak. Right, but if I'm sending that to you, I by no means am taking ownership for any of these responsibilities. It's just proposing these concepts of things that, you know, you know are um, going to be matters at hand. Oh, right, right. No, I'm not calling Scott and saying, and, and by the way, Scott, I'll be happy to uh, take this, this job off your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Scott probably wouldn't appreciate that. Um, or he might. You don't know. Uh, you get pretty busy at the beginning of a, of a protocol. But what you might want to do is if during your conversation they say, oh, you know, I didn't, I really hadn't even thought about that. You might say, well, I'd be happy to help you with that. I have a lot of experience in that area, and, you know, would you like some help? So if you felt like it and if it was okay with your Node PI and, you you know, you had the time and, and the resources to do that, you might offer to, to give some assistance in the background. Um, but I think, no, in general, we're not saying, hey, we, you know, we're telling you how to do your job. We're just saying, you know, we want to open these lines of communication for our site so that we get a good head start on things and, by the way, here's some issues that we wonder what you're thinking about on these so that we know what you're thinking and, you know, maybe you find out they haven't thought about that yet and then you can assist them with that process. Does that make sense? Great for me. Thanks, Frankie. Okay. Okay, so let me go back then. So you've checked in with the lead team. Now you want to bring that information back to your local team, and you want to sum summarize that. Um, again, you want to maybe bring out the protocol issues collection sheet. Now you've made some notes on it as to what what's being done by the lead node, what's not being done, you know, by the lead node, and uh, using that sheet, then um, you and the PI and uh, maybe other members of your study team we'll look at, well, what are some of the various startup tasks that we have to take care of that we're not going to just receive from the lead team, you know, such as potential protocol-specific SOPs, developing a local timeline, hiring decisions, that kind of stuff. 
and um, then uh, either have the PI assign or, you know, you as a team work out the assignments for who is now going to take that information and begin developing those materials or those procedures or um, take over that particular task on your study team at, 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 at the local level. And that moves us, speaking of timelines, into the development of the timeline. And so um, let me, uh, should we open the line up for questions first? Yeah, let's check and see how everybody's doing. Melanie? All lines are open. Thanks. Hi, Kate. This is Bill Chappie. I just wanted to comment on, on what you were saying earlier and, and um, how much as a lead node, um, you know, I, I can say we personally appreciate getting feedback from sites and there's a specific example uh, I'm thinking of where, where you had actually raised, raised some really nice uh, and important questions that, um, you know, we just hadn't, hadn't been able to be clear on. So uh, we, we very much appreciate that kind of feedback and, and sites initiating uh, questions on protocols. Thank you, Bill. And, and you know, that's my experience, too, uh, from a, a, as a lead node manager, or not manage, node manager, but a lead uh, protocol manager, is that as much as you sit and think about this stuff, that you just can't, you know, after a while you get so in, immersed in it, you can't see it from any other perspective. And sometimes it, it's really helpful to have fresh eyes take a look at it and go, you know, oh, gosh, you, you guys totally forgot about this piece of it. And that's extremely helpful. Yeah, that's one of the really, you know, solid benefits of working in a network and working in teams is to get that kind of input as you go along. Right. Any other thoughts or um, uh, questions about doing an initial protocol review? Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and close the lines, and Gloria, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. So we're uh, going to talk a little bit about timeline development. And what we have here in the slides are the different aspects of the study uh, broken down with a timeline. And this timeline is one that is, uh, was developed by the CCTN, which is a standard timeline uh, for protocol development, trial preparation, trial conduct, and publication. And unless you're, really, unless you're involved with the lead though team, uh, the protocol development will be pretty much complete before you're involved in the trial. Now, as Frankie said, if you're able to get on some of those calls before implementation and, and get involved in some of the protocol development calls, if your sites have been selected, if you know that you're participating, that really can be useful. Uh, but a lot of these things are set, off, set forth by the lead node. These are the expectations and requirements from the CCTN and so I wanted to pass them along to you. Uh, so in terms of protocol development, you see that it takes about a, a year for a protocol and its budget to be developed and submitted and approved before the pretrial activities even begin. And we've got some little algebra going on here, but you can see yeah, basically when a, a, something is completed and then you move out a number of months. Uh, after those different timelines. So protocols are reviewed by various uh, boards and, um, and then things are submitted to NIDA and, and finalized and then the study can begin. So here uh, we're looking at trial preparation and um, these are some of the milestones uh, which also are part of pre-implementation. Now, this entire process should take about eight months from the protocol approval to the first site endorsement. Now, during this time, the main elements of site preparation need to be completed, and these things are things like hiring, IRB approval, collecting and organizing all of those materials that Frankie was talking about, uh, setting up the research offices at the CTPs. All of those elements need to be complete within this eight-month period. So this is a, a point at which you can start thinking about what are some of the specific um, challenges or procedures at my node or at my site uh, that might impact 
meeting the goals of this timeline, um, basically this eight months to completion of your pre-implementation activities. So what we wanted to do was open this up for discussion um, to see if people had uh, experiences or, or anticipated what tasks might be a challenge to, to meet these guidelines or what parts of the pre-implementation process might have taken longer than you've expected. Uh, so if we could open up the lines. All the lines are open. Hi, this is Emily in Ohio Valley. I know we participated in a study where the uh, pre the training, what, sorry, required training of the therapist, and it was expected that there, it was going to take two or three months to get it done, but you had to recruit training cases, and it took over a year to get the required training done for the therapist because of recruitment issues in the training cases. So if you're dealing with like a, a therapy trial where, or any kind of trial where you have to meet a certain requirement for the counselors, uh, that could take longer than anticipated. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good example. Hi, this is Scott again. Um, another example that I think we encountered once before in terms of like site selection, uh, we, we had, you know, a couple of sites selected for a study and one site there was a change in, in management at the site and they had kind of a differing opinion about involvement in research so uh, they declined to participate. So kind of threw a wrench in the selection process. Yeah, that's a, another great example. We're going to be talking more about site selection and that very issue uh, toward the end of this call. But, okay, so site selection uh, could also get in the way. Thanks, Scott. Hi, Gloria. This is Christy at UCLA. Um, I think one thing that often comes up for us uh, are issues related to HR and hiring. And, you know, we often are optimistic about how long it will take to get someone on board. But particularly in an academic environment, sometimes that takes a little bit longer um, than usual. And sometimes adjustments have to be made to the timeline with regard um, to that. I'm glad you brought that up. And I think especially for people who are new, newer to the CTN and, and new to their jobs, that's something you would definitely want to check in about um, with a person who is, is in the know about HR at your site. So if you have to hire somebody through uh, the Academic Medical Center or through the CTP, and, and those kinds of requirements may differ uh, based on the sites that you're working with, you may need a number of months for physical exams and certain types of clearances and jobs need to be posted for a certain number of days to make them eligible for internal hires and, and those things vary widely uh, across um, employers. So that would be something to, to really look into carefully. Thanks for that. Anybody ever have any holdups because of an IRB? Plenty of times. <laughs> I was waiting for the roars and gales of I, laughter. Was, yeah, Ben Smith at PI, Gloria. <laughs> We're notorious for uh, very diligent and uh, so moving PI, uh, um, IRB at uh, PI. Yes, very diligent, extremely <laughs> diligent. And um, also there are some uh, IRBs that, that won't let you continue unless they know that everybody else has been approved, and, and, so, and, and I, I think the PIRB has a lot of those kinds of uh, qualifications. So um, you also would definitely want to check with people at your node to get a sense of the IRB process uh, and, and the potential times involved in that. I would say that's true. Every time the other issue is um, for us, we have it at, at our, our node. at. at Psychiatric Institute, but then also a lot of our CTPs have their own IRBs. So every time you make a revision, we have to then go back to each one of these and get them all to approve the new language. So it can be quite um, a lot of stalling in the process. Right. And that goes back to reviewing the protocol because the, the clearer the protocol could be from the get-go, and the fewer revisions that need to be made as you go along. And that, that was a problem because we were doing protocols in the CTM when things were 
you know, relatively new, and we were part of a learning curve of how much um, wiggle room kind of language you wanted to use and, uh, you know, how much of this back and forth was required. So I think now people, uh, the, the protocols are more likely to try to get things to a certain level of detail before submitting. And we were telling people, submit your protocol review. And then they would, but then we would have other changes that we'd have to make, and that back and forth did take a long time. So, All right. Anything else before we move on? I just have to share a, a, an unusual IRB story. Uh, Ohio Valley is part of the uh, CTN33 project, which is working with American Indian tribes. And we started submitting to the tribes right after the, the calendar year began. Um, and we were set up for January, uh, not necessarily IRBs, but tribal council meetings and that kind of thing. But unfortunately, South Dakota has had like nonstop blizzards. So we just now went through our first IRB. <laughs> so you just never know what's going to come up. Yeah, you can't, uh, can't control the weather. And also, a lot of times, dealing with tribal councils uh, and any kind of special populations are going to take a lot more time and a lot more care. Uh, so it's also something to keep in mind. Okay, great. So um, I think at this point, uh, let's move on. Close the lines back up. Thanks for closing. Thank you. Now, in the next slide, uh, we're looking here at the time frames for trial conduct. And, and these really are, um, you know, pretty much open. This is really going to be dependent upon the protocol that you're working on and, uh, you know, the design of the study. Uh, but basically the first participant is randomized about eight months after the protocol is approved for implementation. And then, Again, each protocol will have their own guidelines of when the last participant might be randomized, and protocols will all have goals that you would want to meet in terms of recruitment and randomization, uh, you know, within those protocols. And then uh, trial completion happens after the last follow-up. So trial completion is not when the last person has the last bit of treatment. It's when the last follow-up is complete. And then the guideline from the CCTN is that uh, two months after the last follow-up, the database should be locked. And so this trial conduct all is all encompassing of recruitment, uh, the intervention, and the follow-up phases of the study. And then uh, finally, the timeline for publication. Um, at the final study report, report is submitted to NIDA. That's about four months after data lock. And then six months after data lock, there's an expectation that the primary outcome paper will be submitted to a journal. So that's a, a, a reasonable turnaround for the investigators and uh, other members of the team who are working on those publications to get those things going. Uh, and then that gray box of when the primary outcome paper will be accepted. That's going to depend on many, many things. Um, but but a lot of this is there is some pressure on the investigators to get papers out because 18 months after data lock, all the data set becomes public. And this is now a federal requirement um, of public data share. And so uh, the investigative team has 18 months to get the publications out. And this just uh, is a list of the different elements of implementation and post-implementation that are going to affect your timeline development. So the CCTN guidelines uh, really inform the lead investigators in developing their timeline. And it's up to the project manager to think through some of these issues that we were just talking about of where they may get hung up or where they might speed through, but some of the issues that need attention in order to meet the goals of the timeline. All right. So Frankie is going to talk about HR. All righty. 
Well, uh, Gloria, thanks. You've talked a little bit about some of the HR issues in general that we need to think of um, in regards to you know the timing of uh, HR procedures for each individual group that that's involved in the CTN trial. And just in general, developing a, a human resource plan for a CTN trial can be kind of tricky. You want to make sure that you plan for adequate staff coverage and for backup staff. Um, and I've learned, come to learn that that backup staff piece is extremely important. Um, but you also have to think about time frames for hiring. And if you are planning on um, maintaining that staff person, once the study's ended, then you, you have to think about how you're going to transition them in and out of this study and into or out of their other duties, depending on whether or not they're at the RTC level or at the CTP level. So um, we want to uh, think about that during the protocol review, you're, you're going to have noted what the lead investigator recommends in the way of staffing for the project. Most of the times, there'll be some sort of a general guideline that's already put there in the protocol for you. So you'll know, for example, about how many full-time equivalents or FTEs are recommended for each type of study staff. And you also have determined whether or not you're, you are going to need additional staff members, such as pharmacists or phlebotomists. Uh, the other thing to think about is that sometimes you're going to need a little bit of time from someone just to do some small but very important study tasks like pre-screening uh, pre or evaluating AEs or assisting with the intake process or recruitment. Um, and you have to think about at your site whether this is something you're going to uh, distribute to people and um, you know, just have it as sort of part of your site helps the study along, or whether you're actually going to designate particular people and then take a part of their full-time equivalent and pay for it out of the study funds. You also need to keep in mind that just because the protocol might maybe recommend two full-time RAs, for example, that does not necessarily mean two people. So I want to bring up an example here. This is example one, and in example one, uh, the team has decided that it's best for their site to have one primary full-time RA. You see them there, that's one at 1.0 FTE. And they also decide that um, they want to have a lot of secondary RAs uh, available to them throughout the course of the trial for to cover sickness and um, vacations and things like that. So they want to make sure that there's plenty of backup there. Now this study has um, two full-time equivalents associated with it. So if you see here, we have one person who's full-time, that's going to be our primary RA, one person who's like our main secondary RA, and they're at half-time, and maybe they actually um, take some of the, the study participants on a regular basis. And then you have two people who we've hired in at 0.25 FTE or quarter time FTE who maybe come in and uh, maintain uh, familiarity with the study by picking up, say, one participant per month or by attending the, you know, the project management calls and the national calls, but really only see clients uh, or participants when they, when somebody else goes on vacation or is out sick. And so in this case, the two FTEs that we have available to us are going to be distributed among these four staff members, and they're going to stay even throughout the course of the trial. So that's one way to do it. Another way is example two, and in example two, the team feels like the best way to staff is to have only minimal coverage at the beginning of the trial and then as the trial finishes out. But then as uh, recruitment ramps up, they want to have a lot of staff time available during the periods of heaviest recruitment. So even though there's a really wide variability in the available staff time depending on where you are in this timeline, 
the average FTE is still just 2.0 FTE. Um, and these are just a couple of, of examples. Actual staffing patterns are going to depend on multiple factors like staff availability, the number of different studies running at the site or other types of projects, how complex the trial is, how experienced the site is, and, and those are just a few of the issues that you might want to think about as you determine how you're going to uh, utilize your, your full-time equivalents. So in order to determine this, you want to take first a close look at the time that's required for each procedure for each study visit and the type of staff that's going to be associated with that procedure. Most CTM protocols include a list of procedures for each study visit, and some even provide the estimated time for that procedure. And they will tell you things like, you know, at which visit that procedure occurs, and, um, you know, whether, it, whether it's a weekly thing or whether it's just the beginning and the end. Um, and like I say, a lot of them will tell you how much time they anticipate for that procedure. In the example that I have here, the project managers calculated that approximately two hours and 20 minutes of RA time is needed to perform this screening visit one procedure with the participant. And again, that doesn't include things like data entry and uh, preparing for the study and cleaning up after the study and documentation and all of that sort of thing. So we might want to add another 40 minutes uh, to leave us with a grand total of three hours is required from each RA for each participant at screening visit one. And so then you would, as a project manager, go in and do a similar accounting of the study procedures for the other staff types, such as the medical staff and the counseling staff. And you're going to do that for each visit of the study, gathering the time needed, and again, adding in, rem rem remembering to add in time for documentation, meetings, um, consultations with the, the medical clinician, all of that sort of stuff. Once you have those time requirements in your hand, then the project manager can layer them onto an anticipated rate of recruitment, and you can actually um, uh, extend out a projection of the number of visits the site will handle per week in order to meet the recruitment rate, and you can actually calculate a projection of um, what you, you know, what you think your peak is going to be at the, at the top level of recruitment. And let me just show you an example of what that might look like. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do the, the calculations on this. Um, Although I would like to just say that you can use Microsoft Excel to gather and sort this data. It's really not hard. It's just um, tedious, but it's a really, really good thing to do in association with your budget person or your node um, uh, administrator. And then you can plot the information using Sigma Plot or some other similar program like that that graphs. So if you want to look at this example then, um, we've projected out the participant flow and we have determined that it will peak around uh, 31 weeks after the site is open for enrollment. And uh, if you look on the left-hand side, we've got the number of hours per week that's going to be needed. And um, on the right, that's our participant flow. So uh, going across the bottom, if you look at, at week 31 and go up, you'll see that's our peak. And at week 31, it looks like we're going to have roughly 35 to 37 uh, participants active in the study at that time. And if you look at our uh, the green line first, our physician hours, these actually were our calculations for CTM 30, by the way. Um, your physician hours uh, at that peak were close to 35 hours, so about 34 hours. Uh, per week we're going to be needed for, for physician time. Uh, coming down to the aqua colored line, uh, you'll see that at the peak, um, it actually is a little bit lower. Uh, the, the therapist hours peak a little earlier than that. 
Um, but at, at, at week 31, we're going to need, oh, I don't know, roughly 12, 13 hours a week of therapist hours. And for our RNs, um, we are looking at uh, somewhere between five and six hours a week. Uh, so about, um, you know, uh, almost a full-time physician, um, about a half-time position for a therapist, and about 0.1 FTE of our end time at our peak recruitment. And if you look at that same period, um, now we're just looking at our RAs, and at that point, at the time of peak recruitment, if you look at the dark blue line, you'll see that at that point, we're going to need almost four full-time RAs in order to handle that level of participant flow. So there are a lot of ways to do these projections. This is just one way to do it. Um, and probably you, as the protocol manager, are not going to be the person putting together these graphs. But what you are going to be doing um, is assisting your budget person or your, your node coordinator or whoever it is that, that looks at this kind of, of information. You're going to be doing things like helping them understand which procedures are going to be done by which type of staff person, and you're going to help them collect the time needed per visit for each type of staff person so that then your node coordinator or your budget person or your administrator can take that information then and project that stuff out for you, and that will help assist you in understanding what you as a project manager need to convey to your site or to your PI or to your HR people about what the hiring um, uh, needs are for the study at various points in the study. So once you, again, once you have this information in your hand, you and the rest of your team can take a look at your existing staff. You can determine whether or not the staff hours that you currently have available are sufficient to cover the needs of the study. Uh, for example, you might know that your site currently has three RAs available for the study. Two will be available completely, and maybe one will only be available part-time. And that will give you a total of 2.5 FTE. So using the charts, um, you can look and you will see that the patient flow will require between 2.5 and 3 FTE starting at week 15. And around week 20, you're going to require more than three full-time equivalents. And so your team now has to consider the options. And one option might be that you'd hire a third full-time RA to be ready around week 15 and hope that maybe you could get a few additional hours from your part-time person during the, the peak there at week 20 to week 32. Or another option is that you could hire two additional RAs, maybe one full-time and one part-time, to be ready by week 15. And then the third option is that you might decide, well, gosh, um, that was with us really pushing recruitment, uh, our recruitment rate a little harder. Uh, maybe we would want our recruitment rate to be a little bit more consistent so that the slope of the peak is more gradual and the RA time need is more consistent. And perhaps then you would only need your already existing staff. And then finally, you might layer this graph onto other studies that are being done at your site or other projects. And so you might learn that another study is winding down just as this one is reaching your peak. So instead of having to hire new staff, maybe you can just transfer staff from the old study into this one, and then hopefully you'll be able to transfer them back out of this one into some new project as this particular study winds down. So there's a lot, a lot of ways of looking at this. The other issue besides just full-time equivalents to think about, though, is whether or not you have sufficient expertise for the study on your current staff. Perhaps you need an RN for this trial, but you only have RAs and doctors at your site. And then these charts will help you know about how many hours a week you'll need from a nurse, for example, which will help you determine whether it's more cost effective to hire someone part-time, or maybe you might just want to, you know, thinking about the peak, remember the peak for the nurse was only 0.1 FTE, you might decide, gee, it's maybe even easier and cheaper to just contract them from a nursing agency. Mm -hmm. 
once you've made the decisions about how the staffing needs will be filled, the project manager should then document the study staffing plan, and you may ask, uh, you may be asked by the lead node to um, provide this to them as well. Now you have a sample staffing plan in your handouts labeled, not surprisingly, staffing plan. And uh, with this in hand, you can move forward in preparing your staff for the study, begin the hiring process as needed, and provide a good estimate of the staff time cost to your budget person. So let me bring that up on the screen. And this is an example of one that we used for a study here in, in Ohio Valley. And in this particular study, we had um, the site principal investigator. Uh, and we actually had that as a shared duty. We had our, our node principal investigator and the site principal investigator sharing the duties of site principal investigator because our site investigator was inexperienced with research. Um, we looked at the number of uh, medical clinicians we needed, and in this case, we saw that we already had a couple available to us, but there was one we were going to have to contract with. And rather than go out and just find one uh, on our own, we determined that we would go into the university and see who, who in the university might be available to help us with the study. The pharmacy nurse was somebody who we didn't know who they were yet, but we knew we had enough nurses on staff at that site that we could just pick somebody to uh, serve that function. We identified the counselors. Um, we knew we wanted some counselor backups, but we didn't know who they were. And since um, uh, we didn't need to do a lot of um, protocol-specific training with them other than the intervention, we decided we could wait a, a week or two before we determined who that was, but we knew it would be from the existing site staff. We had the node protocol manager, which is Bob Winters, but actually that was me. Um, the node trial performance monitor was identified. The research assistants were identified, and we identified one of those folks to be the, the site study coordinator to supervise directly at the site. And then we also realized that we were going to need, we had need for more RAs than we had on staff. And so looking at the hiring rates, we decided, well, we needed to pick up that fourth RA uh, about 10 weeks post-initiation so that we were able to have them ready and up and running by week 15 when time came for us to roll over into a, um, a fourth RA. So that is um, this tool. And what I'd like to do is just uh, go ahead and open up the phone lines and um, ask, first of all, if anyone has another HR tool that they'd like to talk about that they've used that's helpful, or any other experiences about the hiring of study staff that they'd like to share with the group right now. All lines are open. Gloria, have you had any um, particular HR stories that you thought might be helpful? HR stories. Oh, I have so many stories. I don't have an HR story off the top of my head, though. <laughs> Anyone else? This is Davina. Um, we've had a few uh, studies, we've done CTN studies in the past, and one thing that we learned after the first one or two was the importance of that backup of the backup. Yes. and to have enough people um, at one point during the HIV CTN5 study, no, no, not that one, 17, um, we had ended up losing like two therapists and two RAs and, you know, all of a sudden had no staff. And for the new studies, we've made sure that we've had plenty of folks who were able to back up and step into any of the new positions um, just so that we don't end up in a situation like that before we're scrambling so much. Yeah. Yeah, and you never you never know what's going to happen, and you can always assume that someone will leave the study team sometime during during the the trial. 
But I, I, I'll just tell a little story of what happened to us in CTN 30. Um, CTN 30, of course, is very heavy on, on physician time. And we had Dr. Somoza um, doing some of the um, medical work, but as the node PI, he, he had a lot of other duties. So he, you know, our anticipation was that he, his time was going to be extremely limited on this study. So we had a, a good deal of time from the, the physician that actually worked at the site, and um, I, I think we had about half of her time. And then we had um, two other physicians, uh, research physicians, who had worked with us for a long time here at the RRTC, who we were going to take some of their time and they were going to, to work on this study. So we're rolling along and um, recruitment, CTN 30 for us was that rare bird where recruitment was absolutely not an issue. In fact, like right off the bat, we had to develop a waiting list because we had so many people. We literally had people beating down our doors to get in. So we were cranking them out as fast as we could, and we thought we were, you know, well covered. And um, the, the spring came, and one of our physicians passed away. And at the same time, the as a result of getting new people in for the study, the clinic itself grew. Um, sort of ginormously, and so the time that the uh, site physician had to give us um, was pared way down. And then shortly after that, our other research physician got hit by a car and was out of commission for about eight months. So <laughs> at that point, now we have all these, all these participants, and suddenly it's down to Jean Samoza, who's the node PI, and, and the doctor at the site to try to cover all of these patients. And we really, really, really had to scramble. And of course, we ended up hiring in a, a, a new physician, but as you know, it takes time to train them and get their licensure in shape. And this particular physician had, all, had retired several years ago and let his, his medical license expire, so he had to go through the reinstatement of his medical license and get his, you know, his VIP waiver and all of that stuff. So, um, I mean, it was really a time and uh, something, you know, that we absolutely could not have predicted. Uh, it, so HR, you know, it's really important that you, you you try to give yourself, like Davina said, as much backup of backup of backup as you can afford to do because you just never know what's going to happen. Yeah, and then also it made me think about... Uh, you know, the, the timing of hiring, and I know, again, in earlier CTN trials when we were really all on this learning curve, a lot of times we, again, we got all excited and we started hiring people, and then they kind of sat around for a while right. uh, before things got going. And so that timing of, of hiring can be really important, especially right. if you're at a place where there are some lags. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And especially now when study budgets are so much tighter than they used to be. And money in general is a lot tighter than it used to be. And we really have to make sure that as we hire people in, we're not, uh, you know, we've really gone to almost a just-in-time kind of procedure so that we're, we're only spending the money when we absolutely need to. Right. Any other thoughts about the HR process? Uh, hi, Frankie. This is Scott. Um, one thought is, uh, I guess, kind of the model of staffing. Um, in some of our studies that we did at community clinics, um, we hired the staff, the research staff, uh, directly from the RRTC. Uh, so they were employees of the node rather than the clinic. Mm -hmm. And then in other studies, we used research staff that were hired directly from the clinic and each presented its own kind of pros and cons. Right. Uh, I think uh, we had a lot of success when the RRTC was directly responsible for um, hiring the research staff. Uh, we had, a, I think, a little more control over that process. That's, that's interesting that you say that because we actually have done it both ways too. And... Um, I, I think maybe it depends on the site. I think we've, 
here in Ohio Valley, we probably have had just as much success when the RRTC has done the hiring as we have when the sites have done the hiring. But I think part of that has been that even though the sites did their hiring, um, we assisted the site with that process. Uh, I know in, in many cases we would help screen, um, particularly in the early days when the sites were first coming on board. The more experienced sites, we really don't do this anymore, but, but with the newer sites, you know, we help them by telling them, you know, kind of prepping them for what do you look for when you're trying to hire somebody who's an RA and educating them on, you know, what are some of the unique needs of research as opposed to uh, clinical folks. And in some cases, we actually did phone screens for them um, and then handled, uh, you know, handed them the, the stack of, of folks that we thought would be good for the second interviews. But uh, you're right. I think there's a number of ways to look at this, and you can really get creative. You know, for, number, for 30, half of the staff was from the RRTC and half of the staff was from the site, and that, that had some unique challenges, but it actually worked out really well. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up, Scott. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and close the phone lines then. And I'm going to hand this over to Gloria, who's going to finish this up with a discussion on budgeting and on site selection. Okay. Thank you, whoever just uh, moved that slide. All right, so uh, your budget is going to really be prepared mostly by the lead node. They will put together an estimated budget of the cost of the study uh, that you are going to incur at the local level. And uh, basically, the, these are the different areas where the budget uh, is going to reflect the money that needs to be spent. Um, and we have a very nice sample budget. And I'm going to open that up, take a look. And this gives you a very detailed accounting of the possible staff that you may need for a study. Now, depending upon what kind of study you're doing, again, the staffing needs will change. Um, and obviously, depending upon what type part of the country you're in and what level of experience of people you hire, the salaries are going to change. These are all ballparks. Uh, and here you'll see basically in every budget that you'll ever do, uh, whether it's for a grant or, or for some other organization, personnel is always going to be the largest chunk of money um, in your grant. And that is going to include both salaries and fringe benefits, and that all gets uh, figured into uh, the budget. And the personnel, and, and Frankie has already gone over a lot of the list of personnel that might be required of a protocol. Uh, you can see them here on this budget rundown. But some of the ones that might be particular to a protocol um, could be IT support. And we're working on 44 right now, which is a web-based protocol, a web-based treatment for substance use disorders. And so the sites may need IT support and to budget for that to make sure the computers are working and that somebody's there to, to do some of that troubleshooting. Also, RAs tend to do most of the data entry, but there can be points at a protocol where uh, data entry needs are greater and somebody new might need to be hired or somebody additional. Also, depend, again, depending upon the protocol, you may need to engage the intake staff at a program as part of your recruitment strategy. And so by hiring on or, or having some budget for intake staff could really help boost your recruitment efforts, that you have somebody at the program who, as part of the intake process, is also has the study on their mind, uh, could be very useful. And some studies now are budgeting for uh, people who do patient locating for follow-up and then also specifically recruiting. Um, a lot of times the research, a lot of these tasks tend to land to on the research assistant um, or a project manager, but 
many times it's better to hire somebody with a specific skill that and if you've ever met a, a person who that's their job is they find patients, they have a specific set of skills and, and knowledge that can be very useful in finding people who to, you know, maybe me or uh, some other part of the research staff, we would say, oh, that person has dropped off the face of the earth. Um, patient locators have a lot of tools in their toolkit uh, and a lot of tricks up their sleeves. And depending upon the sample that you have, you may, some studies might want to uh, invest in a patient locator. And same with a recruiter, although some of that might might have some overlap with intake staff, but here we're talking more about uh, maybe recruiting from outside. So then there are also some possible additional ROTC personnel costs like regulatory staff and QA staff that does the budget may need to offset. Um, some, of it, some of these people are, are typical ROTC staff who do this job. Um, the budget might need to reflect that. Uh, so that's the basic, some of the basic personnel needs. And then, of course, there are supplies, kind of the usual suspects, um, but there might be additional equipment like the 70 below freezer and the centrifuge <laughs> that, uh, that Frankie was talking about. Um, also, participants and, and staff, everybody loves snacks. You might want to put some budget in for that, um, although that might kind of be part of what you do for perks for participants. Uh, but here also, again, it's thinking about protocol 44, people are going to be sitting down at a computer and doing a web-based protocol. We need headphones for them. We need privacy filters. So there, this would capture some of the specific supplies and equipment that you would need for a protocol. And again, a lot of this would get provided to you by the lead node. Travel needs to be budgeted, and this has to do with um, travel to national trainings, potentially. How many staff members need to attend a training? Is it just supervisory staff? Is it frontline clinical staff? As well as the research staff, that needs to be determined. There may be some need to budget in local training uh, travel for QA, especially if you're node has multiple sites that are dispersed far from the RRTC, uh, you may need to get some funds in the budget for that. And then there's also always the issue of uh, participant reimbursement, and that's done differently at different sites. Usually some guidelines are given by each protocol of how much at the different times. Sometimes uh, you give more for later follow-ups to incentivize people coming back for later follow-ups. Uh, you may also, if you're doing contingency management, you would have to budget for the prizes uh, that were given as contingencies. Uh, and then also, you, depending upon where you are, you may want to consider reimbursing participants for travel, um, par perhaps parking, bus fare, whatever that is um, relevant to your specific needs in your region of the country. And then other things to take into account are you going to need to pay rent to the CTPs. Sometimes you don't have to, sometimes you do. That would need to be budgeted. Are there internet services, um, lab fees? A lot of times uh, MS and or the CCTN will provide uh, the urine tox kits, pre pregnancy kits, etc. Uh, but those are the kinds of things you need to know. And then another one of these just to point out is advertising costs. A lot of times it is essential to advertise to recruit participants. And so if you're not sure where you're going to advertise or how much it's going to cost, that's something to, to look into because that, again, will vary uh, by region and by what's available to you. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I, yeah. I'd like to jump in for just a second. You know, you've done a really nice job of talking about all of the things that we have to think about in, in terms of the budget for the study. And and some folks may be wondering out there, well, you know, I'm not the no coordinator. I'm not the, the PI. I'm not, you know, uh, the folks at NIDA who are handing out the money. Why would I care about the budget? And And I just want to say that 
it's really critical to keep in mind that as a project manager, even though the money doesn't technically flow through your hands, as, as, the pro, as the project manager, you're entrusted with the resources that are, are required for running this study. And you need to make sure that you're being a good steward of that. So you need to know how much you know you you have to work with in 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 terms of staff time and in terms of of uh, the kinds of things you can and cannot do in terms of goodies for the you know for the site. Um, the other thing that that it's it's important to keep in mind in terms of the budget is as you think through the budget by telling your node node coordinator every little thing that you need to run the study, it forces you to think step by step about each procedure in the study in order to determine what those supplies are. So for example, if I see in the protocol, oh, we're going to have to do a blood draw and we're going to have to have this many labs. Well, what does that mean? Well, gosh, that means that, you know, do I need a, a blood draw chair? Do I need syringes? Do I need a refrigerator? Do I need to set up a contract with a, a lab? Do I need to, um, you know, it, are they going to like clean, you know, and is that going to be with an alcohol sponge or a betadine sponge? And um, are what kind of uh, uh, tourniquets are we going to use? And all of this kind of stuff that you, if you just saw a oh, blood lab, you might not necessarily think about and then get hit with that when time comes to implement and realize, oh, gosh, uh, I didn't think about, oh, that I'm going to have to have Band-Aids and then I'm going to have to have gauze. Gosh, we didn't put this in the budget. And so as you, as you look at these and you're thinking step by step by step about each procedure, you're also thinking step by step by step about each material that you need so that you can give that to your, your node coordinator or your node PI or whoever's making your, your site budget. Um, and it, it not only benefits them, but it benefits you in thinking about these procedures up front in terms of how are we going to manage these things. Yeah, absolutely. And what's nice, I think, about this training and these tools and the things that everybody here has been sharing is that they, they there seems to be some repetition, right? I mean, we're talking about HR, we're talking about budget, we're talking about staffing. But each component just reinforces uh, the need to look at those issues in making a really good project plan. So thanks for that, Frankie. All right. Well, in the interest of time, because we only have 10 minutes left, I'm going to move ahead to site selection, and then we'll have a couple of minutes left at the end if people want to talk a little bit about budget and advertising. Um, or other issues, but to make sure that we have some time for questions at the very end. So that means I have to do something, which is go back to the slides. And we're going to move on to site selection. And as a, a protocol manager, you will most likely be involved in the site selection process. And uh, basically, site selection entails a, a number of different steps. And now in the CTN, site selection is definitely more of a competitive process than it once was. Early in CTN trials, there were many protocols and not as many sites that met criteria to participate. It was a, a seller's market, right? No, a buyer's market, a seller's market. See, this is why I'm not in finance. So the, the people, uh, so do you want to help me with that, Frankie? I don't know. I'm not real estate either. Yeah, see? Well, anyway, <laughs> there, there was, it was supply and demand. Uh, there was big demand and little supply. How's that? Um, but now things have flipped, and there are fewer protocols under development and an increasingly expanding network. So there's a great supply of CTPs. Um, but not a great supply of, of protocols to, to go around. So um, sites, of course, are wanting to participate, and now investigators can be much more selective in choosing the sites um, that best meet their needs. So that becomes a buyer's market. Now I'm, now I'm nailing it down. 
Uh, so some different components of site selection um, could start with just a questionnaire. Your node might receive a questionnaire that asks some different questions about your sites. There may be interviews involved with uh, the main players who might participate in the study, people from the site, uh, maybe the node PI, the node coordinator, uh, and the project manager. And when site selection is about to happen, or maybe soon after it happens, there could be a site visit uh, to the potential sites. And there are a number of criteria that are considered during site selection, and those include program characteristics, client characteristics, and staff characteristics. So in terms of program characteristics, uh, studies want to know how many new admissions a site has, uh, what's the patient flow, what are your patient retention rates, those things might have uh, impact on a study, what types of services are provided if some studies are particularly focused on outpatient treatment programs, others want residential programs, and some it's okay whether it's outpatient, whether or not it's methadone, uh, but those kinds of services can be important in selecting a site. Also, many studies would like to have some kind of combination of rural and urban sites and that be assessed on the site selection criteria. And is there space for the offices? Uh, is there space at a, at a program to do research? There's a lot of clinical programs where space is at a premium. Uh, and I think we are all very familiar with that phenomenon where, where most of us work. So will there be space for the study to be run? And, and that needs to be assessed. Uh-oh. Uh, so then what are the client characteristics? Here we need to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria of a study. Obviously, uh, demographics, if it's a women-only study, we need to make sure that there are enough women at a program uh, to get an adequate gender representation. Sometimes uh, protocols like the Adolescent Youth Protocol was looking at younger uh, people who were addicted to opiates, and so we needed to make sure that those sites had specific age ranges uh, that were met want to make sure that we get an adequate representation by race, et cetera, so those things would come into play. And then also substances of abuse. If a study is looking at methamphetamine, do we have an adequate sample of methamphetamine users at that site? And then Scott had brought this up uh, in terms of an issue that came up in one of the protocols. What are the staff characteristics? Sometimes staff aren't so interested in research. And if you try to launch a protocol in a program where the people are not really interested in participating, you're going to run into some trouble. And that's what it sounds like what happened um, in that situation that you were describing, Scott. So that's sometimes where a site visit comes in handy and might, might happen uh, to go and get a sense of the culture of the clinic, not only the, obviously not just uh, the clients who are there, but the staff. What is their willingness to participate and what are their attitudes and experiences around empirically based treatments? And then this has also been an issue, I think, um, is time availability and how is that going to get worked out? Will counselors and, and, and clinical staff be able to shift their responsibilities, their clinical responsibilities in order to accommodate the additional responsibilities of participating in research. So all of those things um, need to be considered by the lead node when um, site selection is happening. And uh, the protocol manager will definitely have um, some input in that. All right, Frankie. Uh, maybe we should uh, open up the lines and see if uh, people have questions or comments. And I'm just going to put this kind of summary slide up here in that context, okay. uh, site management or, or the time timeline issues or budget issues we were talking about before or anything else. I'll land here open. So much information. <laughs> oh, we did. We presented a lot of information today. Uh, and 
I think Liz had said, why would, I, why would anybody want to be a protocol manager <laughs> with all these things that they have to do? Uh, and there is a lot to do, and that's why next time we are going to talk more about how to delegate, how to build a good team, and, and hopefully um, you know, be able to manage a protocol and, and feel good about juggling all these responsibilities. Right. This is Linda in Oregon, and I've been project managing for a while, but I wasn't exposed to research, and I have found this um, a really good session, and especially the handouts that you distributed. They are excellent, and uh, thank you for the good session today. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Ed in uh, Delaware Valley. I just wanted to mention that uh, everything that you've been talking about, in my experience over the past couple of years, uh, rubs up against each other because uh, my introduction to uh, the, the study that I was put into the middle of uh, consisted of uh, sitting there for a couple of weeks and observing everything I could. And I found out that everything took longer because of the um, physicality of the site, uh, the interest of the people, uh, and the uh, individual abilities of the client to pee on demand or something of that sort. So um, what we ended up doing, we, we had a nurse die on us. At the same time, uh, uh, shortly thereafter, we were adding uh, the genetics component to the start study, which meant more nurse involvement and capability. So we had to adjust our thinking in terms of personnel to uh, take on a larger proportion um, uh, uh, and direct responsibility for a nurse phlebotomist in order to get that piece of it going because the two RAs that we already had were doing the regular study um, and they were up to their necks and alligators already. So everything leans on everything else. Right. Absolutely. Great point. Well, I see that we have about one minute left, so I guess um, – we should probably go ahead and, and close the lines back. And um, I just want to summarize by saying, you know, today we discussed roles and responsibilities, some of the items involved in developing a project plan. We've given you some resources. Those were sent to you by email, but now, you know, we also have put them in the project manager toolkit that Liz uh, put on LiveLink for us. And then next time, uh, we will spend the, the majority of our time talking about building the study team, communication and um, team building and all of, all of those really important elements that uh, uh, are more heart than logistics. And uh, we will have a little bit of logistics. We've got to have that. Um, we'll end up to next time session by talking about uh, pre-implementation tools. So Liz, let me turn it over to you. Thanks very much. And again, I'd like to thank Frankie and Gloria for their expertise. This has been a really very informative seminar. Uh, everybody, just to let you know what you can expect, I'm going to send out an, uh, an email to all the registrants. It's going to include a link to a survey to provide your evaluation and feedback on today's seminar. And feel free to use the comment boxes to tell me anything you think, because I read them all. Um, and your feedback is really important to me. It, it helps kind of move things in the right direction. So another thing to keep an eye out for is an email that will come out letting you know about the April 23rd Session 2 seminar that's coming up. That, again, is going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll send that out by email, and your registration process has been simplified and has been moved to a paperless process whereby you can just click Reply, and um, that will generate your automatic registration. Um, so we look forward to seeing everybody on the 23rd. Uh, feel free to jump into LiveLink. I'm going to include a shortcut to LiveLink, that um, Project Manager's Toolkit. I hope that everybody will take a look around um, and check their inventory to see what they have to contribute because there's a, there's a lot of very good people out there with a lot of good tools that um, can help some of the newer folks in town. I appreciate everybody joining. We will hopefully see you on the 23rd. Have a great day, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's conference call. We'd like to thank you all for your participation and have a great day. Thank you.